it's my great honor to introduce our second speaker, Yo David, um, which I feel maybe don't need that much introduction. She's a chemical biologist at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. She completed her PhD uh, with um, um, Ami Naven um, in the Weizmann Institute of Science in Israel, where she investigated the assembly and the disassembly of non-canonical polyubiquitin enzymes. And then she moved to Princeton University um, with Tom Mu and uh, used the ultra-fast transplacing Indians um, to chemical tag as well as customize the cellular um, chromatin stat, um, states. Um, with that jump, she then um, moved to uh, Sloan Kettering as an independent uh, investigator, now focused on developing as well as uh, utilize different chemical methods to study uh, the importance of different histone modifications. She has won a lot of awards, um, such as the Maximizing Investigators Research Award, as well as uh, Persian Square Soho Cancer Alliance Award, which is a very a uh, huge award, and there's a really nice article um, called "At Work" um, in Sloan Kettering website. My favorite quote um, from that article is uh, that she said she's allowed it to feel bad um, about the scientific disappointment, but only one for a day, and after that she would get up and dust herself off. Without further ado, um, I would hand the floor to you to tell um, us about her research. Okay, wow. Thank you for reminding me of how uh, convoluted my uh, scientific path has been. I hope you uh, can hear me and um, I can't see you. So I'm going to assume yes, uh, unless otherwise communicated to me. Okay. Um, so it's my really great pleasure to be here today and to present to you um, a, a new project from my lab that I'm particularly excited about, but uh, also very nervous to present because um, I haven't been presenting it. So I would love to get some feedback as we're gearing up towards submitting this uh, work. But as Sky has mentioned, my lab is primarily interested in understanding fundamental mechanisms uh, related to epigenetic regulation of transcription and how the misregulation of these events can lead to disease states. So today I'm going to tell you how a chemical biologist addresses these convoluted problems by developing and applying very powerful chemical tools that allow us to gain deep mechanistic understanding linking specific histomodifications and transcriptional output. I'm sorry, I'm going to step out of the laser pointer because I want to make sure that you guys can hear me. Okay, are we all good with the... Okay. Um, okay. Sorry for that. So uh, I'd like to say that we um, implement chemistry and biology in two main ways. Um, one by really developing... Sorry. There we go. One, by really developing new chemical tools that allow us to investigate new biology, and sometimes I dare to say old biology with a new lens. Um, and today I hope to give you one example uh, from, from this side of the lab. But we're also very interested in understanding chemical events that happen in the cell and how these can change the fate of the cell through changing its epigenetic landscape. And I like to say we thread this uh, interdisciplinary space, moving between chemistry and biology, application and discovery, basic and translational, as well as academia and industry. And I, um, uh, I hope to um, mention a couple of these today. So um, one of the main interests in my lab, like I mentioned, is understanding how chemical reaction can actually directly affect uh, cellular fate by reacting with chromatin and changing the epigenetic landscape. Uh, we believe this uh, serves as a new direct link between environment and, um, and epigenetics and metabolism. And we, we, uh, we have a, a lot of effort involving that, but I will not be talking about that today. We also have a massive effort trying to understand the black sheep of the histone family, which is the linker histone, uh, not just because it's not part of the core, uh, nucleosomal core particle, uh, but mainly because it's notoriously difficult to work with. And in fact, the first paper from my lab tackled that issue and uh, developed a method to uh, tracelessly purify for the first time um, all the human uh, linker histone family. And in fact, um, leveraging this technology, we're also able to collaborate with Arts Kolshi and Ari Melnik, trying to understand how specific mutations in H1 can drive diseases such as lymphoma. 
But recently, effort from uh, Wallace and Sade and now uh, Sarah Faulkner in my lab um, led um, our new understanding for a new function for H1 that might go beyond its canonical function in chromatin compaction. And in fact, potentially in many other cellular events, um, including uh, replication, DNA damage, and transcription. Um, we also have uh, a big interest in uh, ubiquitination events on chromatin, and this comes from my uh, background from my PhD and major interest in ubiquitination, and it turns out that many ubiquitination events on chromatin and specifically on the core histones are poorly characterized, and an effort in that direction led us to identify a new A3 ligase called SMARK A3 that actually ubiquitinates H3 on K23, and this ubiquitination is involved with the regulation of K9 methylation and is important in colorectal cancer uh, driving events. We also have uh, an interest, uh, a detour interest in um, characterizing micronuclei, which are unique for uh, genomically unstable cancer cells. And in fact, are these extra, extra nuclear uh, mini, uh, micronuclei that have a completely different epigenetic landscape. And um, um, Albert Agustinus, from uh, a joint student from my lab and Sam Bakum's lab, had led a, a heroic effort to characterize this epigenetic uh, landscape of micronuclei, revealing that it is in fact quite different from the primary nuclei. And more importantly, when it gets integrated back back into the primary nuclei, it carries uh, a scar. But today, uh, like I said, I'll talk about a new project in my lab that I'm particularly excited about that uh, involves epigenetics of viruses. Um, and I also have to mention that sort of an overarching um, uh, interest we have in the lab is really developing uh, various chemical tools that involve chemical probes, as well as methods in protein engineering that allow us to study many of these biological questions. And in fact, uh, a recent one, uh, it's no longer in press, it just came out online, uh, which is, uh, again, a very um, a great effort by Devin Ray from my lab to try to manipulate cell, cellular surface and surface protein. So if you're interested, it just came up online. So like I said, today I'll focus on a whole new project in my lab that involves a virus, but not the one we're all used to thinking about these days, but still a virus that uh, is very important in actually affecting 5% of the world population. And um, some will claim is even the first oncovirus as infection by hepatitis B uh, can lead to chronic infection and then through a series of uh, increasing uh, severity, inflammation, ferocious, fibrosis, cirrhosis, and eventually hepatocellular carcinoma. Now, we tend to think that this is a more of a developing nation uh, issue because uh, vertical transmission from mother to child is very common in developing countries. Um, and in fact, patients born with infections will develop liver cancer in the early 30s. Uh, but even in um, uh, more Western countries, actually vaccination uh, generally protects the population, but um, immunity is not permanent as evident from the fifth uh, booster we're getting now uh, to uh, COVID, but also um, um, shown in, in many um, events that immunity is not permanent with hepatitis B and more so in Western um, health habits diets and drinking that um, definitely pushes this the severity of this condition. And altogether, even though uh, we're used to thinking of this as a, as a curable um, and, um, sorry, uh, preventable virus through vaccination, as well as high clearing virus, it actually still ranks in the top 10 most killer uh, amongst infectious diseases. So I'm gonna scroll back and talk a little bit about a life cycle and I'm not a virologist, so this is a simplified version, but just so we can understand the uh, main question in hand. So hepatitis B infects uh, hepatocytes through binding to uh, the bile acid receptors. It goes into the, the cell where it's stripped off its capsid and it's partially double-stranded DNA called RCDNA is actually imported into the nucleus. In the nucleus, it gets repaired um, through um, the DNA damage response, similar to uh, and sort of like an Okazaki piece. And then it gets chromatinized by host histones. So that means that all these nucleosomes are made of uh, human histones. And in this chromatinized version, uh, this mini chromosome is called CCC DNA. 
And it is the template for five um, um, RNA species, four mRNAs that will encode for the four key proteins of the virus, as well as the pregenomic um, RNA. The mRNA of the virus, like I said, encodes for four key proteins, two are more structural protein, the key polymerase, and this protein called protein X, which immediately made me want to work on it. Uh, which is the only uh, protein encoded by the virus that actually communicates with the host. And it is thought to have some functions in the cytosol, but what we're interested in is its function in uh, promoting um, transcription of the other, of itself and its other mRNA. The pregenomic mRNA, uh, the pregenomic RNA is then uh, encapsulated and the um, and is then repaired by the polymerase within the virus, and then gets secreted in a non-lytic way uh, to the back to the to the bloodstream. Um, like I said, this CCC DNA or this mini chromosome uh, became uh, very um, appealing to us as a as a study question because. It has never been reconstituted in vitro. No one really knows how it looks, how many nucleosomes really are occupying it. And what was also very interesting is the interaction with the protein X, uh, because protein X is essential for transcription of this CCC DNA, but also it, it binds to it. So we're interested in, in the interaction between them. So that led us to dive just uh, a bit deeper into how CCC DNA gets transcribed. Like I said, it encodes for these five um, RNA species. HBX, um, one of its main functions in the nucleus is actually to induce the degradation of SMC56 uh, because SMC56 has the capacity to silence the CCC DNA. Once SMC56 is degraded um, through the, um, the action of HBX, um, and then the CCC DNA can get uh, transcribed and infection is, is on. But in fact, there is a big chicken and an egg question here because since the uh, protein X or HBX itself is encoded on the CCC DNA, but its presence is required for transcription of all these RNAs, how does uh, uh, infection start? How does transcription of HBX start? And with this sort of question in mind, we started with a very fundamental, um, um, I would say, fruit, which is really trying to understand how the CCC DNA looks and how it functions. And this work was single-handedly uh, spearheaded by uh, Nick Prescott, uh, who's a, a brilliant graduate student in my lab, but has been co-supervised by a real virologist and hepatologist, Rob Schwartz from Weill Cornell, who really helped us in navigating the questions as well as, as the data. And you'll see there is some data from his lab too. So HBV is a deceptively simple virus because it only encodes for these four tra uh, transcript and four proteins, as I mentioned, where two of these are more structural proteins, the polymerase that um, is responsible for the RNA and the DNA uh, polymerase activity and HBX. Uh, without HBX, there is no infection. That is something that is very important to remember and it will become even more important uh, towards the end. But HBX transcription is key for infection and without HBX, if you express the virus uh, in, in a way where there's a stop codon or uh, early termination of HBX, there is no infection. So the first thing uh, Nick has done is spend a lot of time, I mean, it's one slide, but it was a, a really heroic effort to try to understand how you can reconstitute, we can reconstitute the DNA itself. Because as I mentioned, there are overlapping ORFs. You cannot introduce any mutations, any restriction sites or anything like that. So Nick had to uh, take a leaf from, from other um, um, uh, methods in the lab to try to make a truly untouched circular CCC DNA. He then collaborated with uh, Rob Schwartz to show that if you transfect this DNA, it actually induces infection uh, by measuring, you know, the, the, the basically the virus uh, um, presence as well as its load. And in fact, now uh, taking supernatant from cells that were infected and where virus has been generated and doing a secondary infection, we know that this virus um, is functional in secondary sorry, in secondary infection too. 
After uh, we gain access to the DNA, uh, Nick uh, performed in vitro chromatinization, which means it basically took um, octomers of histones, of purified canonical histones, uh, and assembled them onto this uh, CCC DNA. We estimated um, the CCC DNA based on pure sequence uh, that it will be uh, um, occupy about 18 um, nucleosomes which is um, um, will become relevant in, in a second. This is a gel showing the chromatinization. You can take the linear DNA and chromatinize it. You can see the shift in the, in the uh, retention, as well as the circular DNA. Again, when you occupy it with histones, there's a shift in retention. You, you can see that pretty uh, homogeneously. Uh, in order to look at the compaction state, like I said, we reconstituted a um, 18 times 601, which is the nucleosome positioning sequence, the canonical one, uh, 18 repeats of the 601 to mimic what we thought would be a predicted uh, CCC DNA. We've made both a linear and a circular, so we can compare it to the linear and circular um, hepatitis B DNA. And just doing uh, magnesium precipitation, which basically shows the compaction state of the, of the fiber by just ca causing a collapse. Uh, due to competition with uh, with water molecules, um, any divalent ion will will cause basically these um, fibers to precipitate. But there is a correlation between how much or at what concentration they they precipitate and their compaction state. And you can see that all these are very similarly uh, compacted. Um, Having access to atomic force microscopy, as mentioned in the previous talk, we had uh, the, the great satisfaction to visualize this uh, chromatinized CCC DNA on atomic force microscopy or AFM. And you can see the structure um, of the compacted uh, DNA. You can even count the nucleosomes that are present in the CCC DNA. And, um, and we gave us some really beautiful um, understanding of the, um, of the surface of this uh, CCC DNA. But of course, we're interested in understanding how exactly the nucleosomes are positioned. And in this case, we collaborated with Viviana Riska from Rockefeller, who helped us to perform an MNA-seq. Uh, of course, in this crowd, I don't need to uh, present MNA-seq, but uh, MNA just cleaves the free DNA and uh, leaves pretty much untouched the nucleosomal one. And you can purify the nucleosomal DNA and sequence it. And uh, this is, uh, this is uh, um, the uh, traces we got from the MNA6 showing actually pretty well-defined architecture of nucleosomes along the CCC DNA. And um, this was really very satisfying, but um, we decided to look at different stages of uh, chromatinization to try and understand exactly how the saturation um, of the uh, final mini chromosomes looks. And this is an AFM uh, of either the naked DNA that in fact um, is has a hard time to even uh, adhere to the silica, but you can see it here. But the undersaturated, intermediate, and saturated, you can see how they become, the CCDNA becomes more compacted and more of a uh, defined structure. Taking these uh, uh, different species, we decided to look at the transcription um, of the different ORFs. Now, because as I mentioned to you, um, I, uh, the mini chromosome has uh, overlapping ORFs, you can actually use a single um, region to quantify the total RNA um, of the transcripts. And in fact, if you take uh, either the linear or the circular, DNA and you do in vitro transcription of the non-chromatinized, so just the DNA, as well as the chromatinized, you can see an interesting phenomenon where the chromatinized CCDNA in fact uh, shows an increase in transcription uh, and even more so when it's a circular species. Now, this was an interesting phenomenon because we raised and taught that uh, chromatinization is actually a barrier for transcription, but in this case, it actually enhanced the transcription of the CCC. So in this case, Nick decided to uh, to take a very smart um, um, stepwise analysis of this transcription um, event and both look at different uh, intermediates of the saturated CCC DNA, as well as starting to deconvolute all the transcript in the um, in in the in the genome. So basically, looking at each of them separately. 
And what you see here um, is, um, again, each of these transcript and then going from free DNA to slowly increasingly chromatinized DNA. And what is interesting to see is that with most of these, there is uh, some increase, maybe uh, some would say a modest increase, but definitely um, a uh, statistically significant increase in, in uh, transcription after chromatinization. Uh, but it was um, sort of modest and gradual. And what was very interesting and surprising and uh, a real, you know, high five fist pump moment uh, was actually looking at the effect on uh, HBX transcription. So in fact, HBX transcription showed zero, um, um, zero effect on the DNA or zero levels in the DNA and in the undersaturated species. But once uh, chromatinization became, to, became more uh, defined, then transcription of the HBX became very, very robust. And this looks um, um, very sort of black and white, which really reminded us of, a, of an on-off switch of uh, infection. And it's a very, very uh, reproducible um, result, took us back to trying to understand uh, the mechanism uh, of how this might work. So it's important to say that HBX uh, promoter by itself is actually a relatively weak promoter. So that will become um, important in a second, because if we look at um, and basically chromatinization of the undersaturated versus the saturated, and we look exactly where protein X is, is right here, what is apparent is that there is a really nucleosomal depleted region right upstream of the uh, transcription start site. And um, that really was um, very uh, robust and even more so when we compare to published results from a CHIP-seq analysis that was done on CCC DNA where both hep uh, hepatocytes, primary hepatocytes and patient samples were analyzed for the presence of an active mark uh, showing the uh, nucleosomal, the minus one nucleosome and the plus one nucleosomes of uh, the HBX transcript. And again, this really brought us back to a uh, basic mechanism of transcription where the minus one nucleosome, the plus one nucleosomes create um, a defined space where the nucleosome depleted region or nucleosome free region is, um, is uh, vacant to allow for the transcription machinery to dock. And um, in, uh, in that case, if that is the case, that chromatinization actually creates that definition of the minus one and plus one um, uh, nucleosome, our immediate thought was, okay, can we look at early events of tr transcription and can we try and look at this chromatinization um, in early stages? So first, Nick had to actually establish um, the, um, the presence of HBX transcription in early time points. This was also never done before. He did RNA-seq um, of really early infection states. And what is um, what you can see here is that in 24 hours after infection, all the transcripts are actually present. But if we take a closer look at the earlier time points, the four and the eight hours, which was the, the goal of this experiment, we can see that indeed HBX is almost the only transcript that is present. So in early time points, HBX is the only one that is transcribed. So in that, at that point, we were very excited. We said, okay, maybe chromatinization converts this HBX weak promoter to a very strong promoter by defining a minus one and plus one uh, nucleosome, basically presenting this nucleosomal free region to the transcription machinery to transcribe immediately protein X so it can drive the transcription of all the other genes. And that was a very appealing um, um, hypothesis. And to test this, uh, Nick decided to try to um, um, inhibit pharmacologically chromatinization. That is not a very simple task, and we're able to find um, these small molecules that either target um, CAF1 um, uh, chaperone, uh, FACT chaperone, um, or the BAF complex that is a remodeler important for spacing. Um, and we, I just told him, buy all of them and let's try and see how they affect HBX transcription. Because if we can stall or delay 
uh, HBX transcription, perhaps we can even um, delay infection. So that is the ultimate goal of the experiment. So what Nick did is first he did a pretreatment with one of these small molecules and then transfected with our CCC DNA and then followed transcription of HBX in time. And uh, what you see here, this is the control, this is the transcription of the virus. And what was very aberrant is that while one, two, three, four um, of the small molecules had no effect, in fact, maybe even enhanced transcription of, of uh, HBV genes, CBL 137 caused a severe decrease or attenuation in HBX transcription. Going into a uh, time course, we can see that there is a time course effect. Again, CBL-137 is completely in inhibiting or down-regulating um, the HBV transcription. There's also a dose dependence um, of the CBL-137, and the dose we've been using is somewhere around the IC50. Um, but then uh, we started looking deeper into CBL-137, and it turns out that it's not quite a fact inhibitor per se. In fact, it's more of a uh, destabilizer of chromatin. So Nick decided to test this in vitro. He took a mononucleosome and subjected it to CBL-137. And you can see this is a native gel. If you treat these mononucleosomes with CBL-137, they completely fall apart. This is the protein and this is the DNA. He took two other destabilizers, um, actinorubicin and, uh, and doxorubicin, and indeed saw some destabilization with those, but not with other intercalating um, agents such as etoposide and HOST. He uh, very recently uh, also took the CBL-137 into um, CCC DNA. And what you can see here is that in the presence of uh, histone, so this is the CCC DNA, if you add CBL-137, it completely falls apart. He decided to go into cells. And indeed, if you treat cells with either CBL-137 or another uh, acloribicin, which is another uh, destabilizer, as well as alpha manitin, which is completely RNA polymerase inhibitor, all of these cause an attenuation in HBV transcription um, and, um, and what we think will be also infection. So um, if I summarize what we have uh, discovered in this kind of convoluted uh, project that started from really basic understanding and somehow led us to a potential morning after pill for HBV is that what we think happens in the transition in the chromatinization state of the repaired DNA to the uh, fully chromatinized DNA is that the chromatinization converts a, the weak uh, HBX promoter into a much stronger one by positioning a minus one and a plus one nucleosome, allowing the transcription machinery to dock very, very quickly. So within four hours, there is an HBX uh, transcription and uh, following translation, HBX is then able to dock back to CCC DNA and somehow promote the expression of all the other um, uh, HB, HBV um, genes. And we're now also investigating that side of the equation. How exactly is HBX docking onto chromatin um, and how it might be affecting their transcription? And uh, one major uh, experiment that we're currently doing is really testing this morning after pill hypothesis that, uh, that I have. Um, uh, first of all, of course, doing a pretreatment. Uh, if we pretreat these um, hepatocytes with CBL-137, whether we can delay infection, but the therapeutic strategy where can we within a short uh, uh, time scale um, target the infection by treating the CBL-137, thus preventing uh, CCDNA establishment, um, potentially inducing its degradation, and thus preventing completely the, um, um, the HBV infection. And with that, I will thank my lab. Hopefully Nick is not completely, um, you know, uh, cringing about his boss presenting his work. I have an incredible uh, lab that I work with, uh, great collaborators on various projects, very fortunate to be supported by various um, federal and private foundations. And we couldn't do any of this without the amazing cores at Sloan Kettering. 
And if you want to learn more about the David Lab, this is where we are. And uh, I'll take questions now. Um, thanks, you for a wonderful talk as always. Um, so if you have any questions, um, please feel free to type them in the Q&A box um, or also raise your hands so we will unmute you. So the first question we got, it's a little bit technical. Um, the question is whether the in vitro transcription down on the high magnesium chloride um, conditions where the chromatin is um, precipitated. Yeah, so obviously uh, it's very important, but the in vitro transcription um, kit we use has uh, some magnesium, but has a lower concentration of magnesium because otherwise the, the chromatinized substrate will be precipitated. So that's very important. But you have to have always some magnesium because of the ATP. Ben also has a question um, that he's going to ask himself. Yeah, fascinating talk. I really enjoyed that. Um, I was wondering, have you thought about looking much at where polymerase is and if like if that can tell you a bit more about the transcription mechanism for HBX like is it pausing is it all those sorts of questions yes uh excellent question there is a lot of chip seek in our near future and that's definitely one that is on our list um we're uh, interested in not just where the pole to, but some of the other, you know, histone marks where they are positioned. And in fact, whether the transcription itself changes the deposition of the nucleosome. So um, we have a lot of, it, yeah, it opens a lot of questions uh, for us to tackle. Yeah. And then one follow up with CBL 137, that's, you know, kind of thought to work through fact at times. I don't know yeah. if that's, I don't know how solid that is, but I was wondering if. <laughs> Would you see a different thing for um, the the virus transcription in a cell that didn't express fact or one that did? Yeah, so uh, definitely we have in our mind the RNA I root. The problem is that many of these uh, remodelers are essential, so you need to do um, um, inducible transient um, downregulation, and then coordinating it with the infection it becomes a little tricky. But it is definitely something we're interested in doing. But because we don't we're not necessarily sure how the destabilization, if it's indeed through the deposition in the deposition step, um, um, we, yeah, I'm not sure how exactly we'll tackle that. I guess we're in some ways lucky that the small molecule is really addressing um, several mechanisms at once because it's right preventing the chromatinization, but also destabilizing anything that is chromatinized. Um, we uh, we definitely were thinking of also doing some RNAi inducible to look at maybe which exactly what the stage in which exact remodeler might contribute to this because this doesn't also cover all the remodelers. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Yeah. A related question to your compound, it's the CPL-137. When you use at the dosage that destabilizes the SPV, um, how about the, like the chromatins of the cells, are they also getting destabilized or? That's a very good uh, question. We haven't done any analysis, particularly on the host chromatin. Uh, CBL-137 is FDA approved for treating patients uh, with uh, very severe brain cancer. So it's definitely not um, toxic. So if it was completely destabilizing the host um, chromatin, I think it would have killed the patients, uh, but we haven't done a thorough analysis to see what exactly, what changes it induces in the, in the host. Um, you got a lot of questions to go. Uh, another question is whether the H1 linker histones are also present in the packing? Ooh. <laughs> I love that question. I hope Nick hears it right now because I, um, I think there, there are some indications that not just H1, but also histone variants are present in the CCC DNA. I think it's a very cool new topic to explore. And in fact, having the functional CCC DNA that is a um, physiological relevant um, substrate for transcription, so it's not a you know, a uh, synthetic plasmid like other people use, it's an actual mini chromosome, gives us the opportunity to now ask questions um, about what happens when you add linker histone to uh, this mini chromosome, what happens when you play with the variants. Uh, the answer is we don't know, and there are some indications which I think why we should do the experiment. 
So Felix had a question. Um, he said, um, great talk. Um, did you look at the nucleus affinity of the HBX promoter sequence? And did you try changing it and see whether that affects transcription? Um, he was also wondering if your in vitro transcription result doesn't suggest a chromatin remodeler independent process. So two very good questions. One is that uh, the first question is the affinity. We it's very hard to manipulate the DNA of the CCC because every base pair is used by at least two transcripts. So it's really hard to manipulate it. We were thinking of introducing a 601, a strong nucleosome positioning sequence instead, like where it's supposed to be and see that we can enhance it. It's something we're working on. In return, we're also trying to manipulate the nucleosome depleted region and block it and see if we can block the HPV transcription in vivo. Uh, we haven't done the precise calculation of affinity because it's an affinity of an octomer to DNA. It's, it's not, it's, it's, got, it's gonna be a bit more complex and in the context of the CCC. Um, I agree that the in vitro transcription assay might suggest that there is some positioning that is inherent. And I completely agree because if you give it the free DNA, there is no transcription. Only when there's nucleosomes there, there is transcription. Now, I don't know in vivo if their remodeling is a bit more accurate and then there is you know, more transcription. But I think what we claim is that there is some inherent um, function or um, utility for the chromatinization itself. So just by the um, the inherent uh, positioning as it is, as it is dictated by the sequence. So we don't know, you know, based on our MNA seq in vitro and in vivo, it seems like there's no major difference. So if you look at the where the nucleosomes are positioned in our in vitro reconstituted system, as well as CCDNA extracted from the liver from human patients. It's very, very similar. So there might be some nuances with the remodeler there, but I think the information or the majority of the information is there. And the reason why CBL 137 works is because it destabilized these nucleosomes, not necessarily prevented the um, or inhibited the fact, basically. Yeah, and a related question that uh, someone asked is whether you um, are going to do some proteomics on this mini chromosome, like to see what it's bonding there to promote the <laughs> process. Would love to. So the problem with the cDNA is that it presents in very low copy number. So it's like one to two per cell. We do have the ambition to purify that. And we have a really nice system that I hope someone will pick up because, uh, you know, uh, Nick is on its, on his way out. Um, but we have a really nice system to enrich for the CCC DNA specifically using dead Cas9 tiling. And we, one of the first thing I want to do is proteomic and see what are the proteins that are decorating the CCC DNA, but also what are the non-coding RNAs that might be involved? Because I think there is some function for, for that too. So we have um, two raised hands. Um, Camila, um, I'm going to unmute you so that you can answer, um, ask the question. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So very fascinating talk. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I have a question uh, related to the MNA's digestion. <clears throat> So you mentioned that maybe I just lost it, okay? Maybe you already mentioned and I missed this, this detail, but uh, you said that basically there is a similarity in the way in which nucleosome are positioned in the, let's say, X cell kind of extraction of the material and from the in vitro. However, you showed some very nice data showing that uh, when you are trying to reconstitute the, um, the basically the, the chromatinized uh, situation, so you also have some sort of intermediate. Did you do MNA digestion also in this intermediate in order to try to understand, for example, if specific yeah. positioning is kind of going hands in hands with the level of uh, expression of the mini chromosome? Yes. So we tried to do um, one intermediate. I agree that it's fascinating. So I'm going to 
hopefully you can see it. Um, can you see it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can see it. yeah. So this is the undersaturated. You can see, we thought we'll see, oh, some chromosome, uh, nucleosomes are there and some are not. But what you can see is that many of the nucleosomes are actually there. It just that um, it's harder to see is that their levels are are just higher. They just increase in level. So there is more of the species that are being occupied. It's not like there are some nucleosomes that are there first and some that are that appear only here and uh, oh sorry only here and not here because they're all present to some level or. Um, in both the undersaturated and the saturated, if that makes sense. Okay, so then it means that really like the fact that you add some specific kind of, uh, uh, okay, following what uh, Ben was saying, then it will be interesting to this different system to try to see if the polymer is distributed with less efficiency or in different places. Definitely, I agree. I agree that that is something we are underway of doing. That opens to my last question, if I can. Yeah, sure. <laughs> uh, and is like, okay, so all this is like, you know, what's happening into the DNA, but how this process is going to be taking place in the 3D nuclear organization? Do you have any idea or attempt to try to see, for example, if this mini chromosome is, for instance, interacting with other portions of the genome? During the process, yeah, so this was actually done to some degree. So there is some um, analysis. I don't remember if it was high C uh, or some some sort of um, um, three C uh, analysis that showed that you know the the CCC DNA is sometimes associated with open chromatin regions in the host, potentially you know to be associated with active transcription. So that was. Um, done before. Um, that's something that maybe with the new information would be interesting to, to see maybe the different stages, whether it changes location, but at least the canonical way of thinking is that because the CCC DNA needs to be transcribed, it is associated, it is in, the, in, in proximity to the host um, chromosomes or um, euchromatic regions. Yeah, somehow, you know, if you <clears throat> if you find that there is a specific locus that is kind of uh, driving, like, you know, as a sort of a bicycle, you know, also the transcription of the of the mini chromosome, it will be interesting because whatever it's uh, interfering with the specific locus transcription levels, it may be eventually bringing to a regulation of the, also the mini chromosome, of the mini chromosome or potentially the chromosome of even more interestingly, maybe the mini chromosome then, if you alter the locus, it may be going to use another one, which in terms of how the transcription is compartmentalized. You mean like adapt, almost like adaptation to um, to maybe some hindering in the, in the chromatization activation. Yeah, Potentially, I, so, yeah. You know, I think that if, you know, if we end up going the CBL 137 route, we will have to do some analysis of to where the CCDNA, whether there's some compensation, some adaptation. We will definitely dive deeper into that. Very cool. Thank you so much. Um, so our one last question, um, it's from Katarina. Um, she's already um, muted and she will ask the question herself. Hi, uh, great study. Uh, first of all, I'm very happy you are using CBL-137, which was actually discovered in our lab. And um, I have two very related questions. Uh, first, is there any evidence that HBX uh, transcription in cells in native conditions starts after chromatization or before chromatization? Is it known or not? Um, it is thought that their, the partially single-stranded DNA is not a good substrate for transcription. From what I know, the transcription happens after chromatization, yes. And is it anything known? Um, I assume in cells it's not very clear, but at least in an in vitro transcription system, why a uh, naked uh, kind of DNA doesn't allow good transcription or at all transcription of HBX because it's kind of my... It's out there, right? 
<laughs> yeah, it's competition with other promoters, stronger promoters no. on this. So uh, yeah, exactly. So what we think is if you know, if we look at the transcription of the other three um, genes, we see that there is transcription of these other genes, even on free DNA. So we think that there is a preference for these genes because their promoters are stronger. Uh, for, so these genes are transcribed first and HBX um, promoter is very weak. So if there is some transcription, it's more of a baseline um, sort of uh, transcription. And, and in fact, there, there has been papers that took the HBX um, promoter, put it on a reporter gene and showed that out of the four, it's the weakest reporter, the, the weakest uh, promoter um, to, to, um, to induce transcription. So my hypothesis, and I don't know, maybe Nick will have to weigh in on this, is that it's a very weak promoter. The three other ones are much stronger. The, the polymerase docks there more. There is some basal transcription of HBX because it's there, but it's, but it's very, very low levels. Thank you very much. It's actually a great thank you, system. And thank you for a great molecule. <laughs> thank you. It's a great system to study transcription in principle, because if you think why to have such a weak promoter on HBX, it would be just <laughs> simple. So my <laughs> very hand wavy hypothesis, again, don't quote me on any of this, is exactly what I, what I said that there is an advantage for a quality control mechanism for the virus when it enter, enters the cell. If the repair of the partially uh, single-stranded DNA is not efficient, that the chromatinization is not efficient, there is no point for the virus to sort of waste a good cell on a non-productive virus. So basically it gives an opportunity to another virus where repair happens better, chromatinization happens better to actually go all the way and drive the infection. So that's my hypothesis, that it's just a, an evolutionary mechanism to make sure that in, um, um, efficient viral infection is happening and not uh, non, uh, non-productive one. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you.